Uh, hi, this is a workshop basically about uh, generating uh, images and texts, and we will uh, uh, go through it. So, one part of the, the first part of the workshop, it's going to be about image generation, and the second part, it will be given uh, on uh, text generation. Oops. Well. So, uh, I am uh, Dimitra from, for the first part. And uh, I work as a data scientist in ASML. I am actually machine learning architect there. And uh, yeah, I would like to introduce uh, uh, students who did their internship at uh, Greenhouse uh, here, uh, Sonali and uh, Kuhn. Hello, everyone. <laughs> yes, and now it's working. And. Uh, Okay, this workshop started as an idea to focus more on image generation and uh, go through that. But since generative modeling is a relatively new topic there, uh, we, uh, we decided, having met uh, Sonali and Kuhn, that uh, it's uh, a very nice idea also to give uh, uh, some workshop on uh, different types of models for different types of data. Uh, images and text, they are quite different. So, uh, yeah, the pixels in uh, an image, they are continuous data, while the text, it's uh, the words there, they are uh, discrete data. Uh, in the images, we see uh, spatial dependencies there, while in text, uh, we see time uh, sequences. And, uh, as a result, and also, uh, images are not uh, sensitive to local changes, while uh, a text, it is. As a result, the models that they are uh, used there for uh, generation of images and text, they are completely different. And we will give you an idea about it uh, uh, now. So who of you, or how many of you are uh, um, familiar with uh, generative models? Okay. How many of you uh, have uh, used the generative models? Okay, a few. That's uh, fine. So, uh, I expect then that uh, the basics of it, uh, uh, some of you know it. Uh, what uh, a generative model tries to do, it's uh, not to predict uh, uh, some t target values as uh, discriminative models they do in machine learning, but it tries to learn the data distribution. So for example, we have a, a set of images. What it tries to do, it's to understand what is the distribution of those images. And it does that so that it can mimic that uh, distribution and, uh, um, and uh, start uh, sampling from that uh, distribution in order to generate new uh, images in that case. And uh, what are the requirements that we have for those new uh, observations, new data points that uh, we want to have? They have to look similar uh, with uh, the original observations in the sense that uh, they come from the same distribution but also uh, quite different so that they uh, are still uh, original and they give some new information so they don't look exactly as what uh, we have seen before. We will see those uh, through the uh, workshop since some of you, uh, also most half of the room is knows about the generative modeling. I won't go through one example to save some time. And uh, one, uh, what I'm going uh, to uh, present for image generation, it's I will focus on variational autoencoders, which is based on autoencoders. Uh, it extends that idea. How many of you know about autoencoders? Okay, and how many of you have used autoencoders? Okay, so I will. Uh, Explain it then, um, I will uh, be brief, uh, brief for, for uh, uh, those of you who, have, uh, who know that. So what is an autocoder? It's uh, a network uh, that uh, takes as input, that uh, has the same input and output, a neural network. And uh, why is this uh, interesting? Basically it's uh, quite uh, interesting because of uh, its architecture. So basically at, uh, uh, we have uh, layers that uh, they uh, take uh, the input and uh, uh, they uh, decrease their number of units as uh, the number of layers increases till they reach uh, 
a layer with a small number of uh, units, the smallest number of units, which is called uh, bottleneck. And uh, that uh, uh, bottleneck, after that bottleneck, then they start increases, increasing their number of units till they uh, reconstruct, basically, uh, the uh, input that they had. And it's uh, um, the first part of the network before the node, the uh, bottleneck, it's called encoder, and the second part is called decoder. And what the bottleneck does, it basically gives a code, a compressed representation of uh, uh, the initial uh, uh, input that we give. Here we see an example, for example, with some uh, uh, digits, which is uh, yeah, pretty uh, trivial, basically, for uh, image generation. Um, and what are the applications of it? Uh, dimensionality reduction, for example, if uh, you have a code of two dimensions, then someone can visualize the data and start understanding uh, the data and observe it, because uh, high dimensional data gets yeah, more difficult. You cannot visualize it and get some insights from them. Yeah. Uh, it's of visualization, anomaly detection. So for example, someone can see if uh, when you learn your data distribution, and, uh, and uh, some anomaly comes, it, you expect that it has higher distance than the rest of your data. And uh, this, uh, it's better to be done in a low dimensional space because in high dimensional spaces, distances can be misleading. It's called the curse of uh, dimensionality, basically, in machine learning. And uh, this is yeah, something that could have been used for uh, image uh, generation. But it's not uh, very efficient. Uh, um, what, uh, because what they try to do, uh, what autoencoders try to do, it's just uh, to reconstruct the input very well. So their loss function, it's just to minimize the distance between the reconstructed input and the, re the original input there. Here it's just, uh, yeah, just put mean square error, it can be uh, anything. Uh, and as a result, uh, for example, if we want to see how um, this, uh, uh, the representation, their code looks uh, uh, like, if we do it for uh, multiple, uh, for uh, the full data set with uh, digits, what we see is basically this type of visualization. Here it's uh, color, it's one uh, digit, uh, yellow it's one, and so on. And, um, if someone wants to generate new images uh, from, the, from that, uh, 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 from that uh, low dimensional representation, what it has to do is uh, to uh, sample uh, the space and uh, uh, just try to uh, pass uh, that uh, sampling uh, through the decoder and to get a generation of images. But this does not work well. So if someone uh, tries to um, sample uh, an image like uh, like okay like uh, uh, here in the middle we see that there is a gap so um, how how this uh, Im how this uh, sample can has to be reconstructed it's not uh, very clear because of the gaps and also what we see is that uh, there are areas uh, and the uh, uh, Latin space uh, uh, representation, that uh, they are highly dense and other uh, parts of the area that they are uh, uh, much less dense. And uh, as a result, how to sample also these uh, uh, different density areas, it's not uh, very clear. So if someone uh, wants uh, uh, to, to use autoencoders as they are for reconstruction, uh, it doesn't uh, work because of those issues. And to those issues, the uh, discontinuity of uh, uh, the Latin space, uh, the different uh, uh, spread of data points, it can be also an indication of overfitting, uh, what we can say uh, in machine learning for uh, autoencoders. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the issues that a variational autoencoder uh, is uh, really uh, is going to uh, work against and uh, uh, so who of you or how many of you know about uh, variational encoders already Phew, very few and uh, okay so i will uh, um, 
explain. Uh, if you have uh, questions about variational encoders, uh, feel free also to ask uh, uh, during the presentation. Uh, so I will give an explanation and then we will go to the notebook. What is the difference between uh, how they try to solve these overfitting issues and uh, this, uh, what we saw, this uh, discontinuance of the Latin space and uh, these problems? It's by, uh, instead of mapping one point to, um, uh, one uh, input to observation to one point in the Latin space, they map it to a distribution, to a normal distribution basically, around a particular point. So the encoder, instead of uh, uh, returning back uh, to, uh, via, uh, the, to the Latin space one, uh, the, some coordinates for one point, it returns a mean and uh, a standard deviation value for uh, that particular input point. In uh, this way, what is being ensured is uh, that uh, it's not just one point that when, it when it's being decoded, it will, uh, uh, ge it will uh, uh, generate an image similar to the original one, but it's a neighborhood of, uh, uh, of points that uh, they can uh, generate similar images. So, uh, uh, the issues of this continuity, uh, it's, they are going to be uh, resolved uh, this way. And uh, uh, autoencoder, this type of autoencoder, it's very likely that it will return well-formed images, even if from the regions where we didn't have uh, any uh, po points originally. So uh, how the... Uh, Network uh, uh, structure, it's going to look like. It's uh, very similar with the previous one, but now we have a kind of a probabilistic view uh, of uh, the encoder mostly and the full network as well. So uh, the uh, encoder for each point will uh, return uh, the mean and the standard uh, deviation of particular distribution. We want... Um, that uh, distribution to be very close also to the standard normal distribution, which means basically the distribution with mean zero and uh, standard deviation one. And uh, from uh, those uh, uh, yeah, distributions, in order to have a Latin space uh, representation, we need to sample. This is a very normal way to sample uh, from the mean, the standard deviation and some uh, randomness uh, there that it's uh, presented by epsilon, and then we can have uh, we can pass our sample to through the decoder, which is exactly uh, the same as the decoder in uh, the normal autoencoder. It can be anything. I have also there some uh, normal network units. It can be anything. It can be convolutional uh, layers. It can, be, and also in uh, our uh, demo we are going to have a convolutional uh, layers there. And just uh, a small uh, uh, idea of how the loss function looks in the variational lotto encoder. We have, again, the reconstruction uh, loss part, where basically the decoder tries, uh, and the full network, they try, they try to uh, reconstruct their input as best as they can. So uh, there it's uh, basically the log likelihood, the negative log likelihood of uh, our data given some uh, uh, encoding error. It, yeah, you can see it uh, very similar as the uh, reconstruction uh, error of uh, the normal encoder. It's uh, expressed in a probabilistic way because it's a probabilistic uh, structure variational on encoders. And there is then a second part in the loss function, which is, like, uh, which is uh, uh, noted there as uh, a loss uh, uh, KL, it's kullback libeler divergence, basically, between the distribution that the encoder um, returns back for a particular input and the standard uh, normal uh, distribution. So what uh, here we try, uh, they, uh, they try to do, it's to penalize any distribution that is returned back from the encoder that it's not uh, close to the standard normal distribution. So this acts as a regularization factor to uh, variational autoencoders and it helps them uh, generalize uh, very well and also uh, have uh, 
a very nice uh, structure in the Latin space because we all know normal uh, distributions that uh, uh, they are quite smooth. So if we want for the same example to see how um, uh, the same representation will look like, we see now that, uh, yeah, indeed the space uh, doesn't have gaps and all the points, they are quite uh, uh, similarly distributed in the space. So someone can uh, yeah, just sample that space, a random uh, point in that uh, Latin space, and to generate images. And uh, those images will, uh, will be well formed with uh, high probability, basically. We will see this in uh, our uh, workshop. One thing that uh, I would like uh, uh, to mention uh, last before we go to our uh, hands-on session it's that variational encoders, uh, despite the fact that they have these nice properties, they tend to uh, generate blurry images. So what people usually do uh, in order, if they are interested also in the decoder uh, part, the deco decoding the results, they combine it with uh, uh, adversarial neural networks, uh, generative adversarial neural networks. And the way, uh, so that uh, basically, they get some help in uh, training uh, the decoder. And uh, the way that uh, this works, it's uh, um, they uh, uh, have, uh, uh, let's say this is the part of uh, variational auto, uh, I didn't explain uh, GANs. Are you, do you know how GANs work? How many of you do you know, do they know how GANs work? Okay, I will uh, explain them. So the way that uh, GANs work, it's, uh, uh, they have a, a generator that uh, takes uh, random uh, samples, uh, ra take random samples, some noise, and uh, it tries to produce some images, fake images. And they have a second part, like a discriminator, which tries to understand if those images are the, that they have been generated by the generator are fake or real. So. They, it's, uh, yeah, guns, they are known for having very uh, sharp image generation, but they are very difficult to be trained because they are quite unstable. So a combination of the two, it, uh, and also they don't have uh, a Latin space like autoencoders or variational autoencoders, a low dimensional representation that uh, can help us uh, perform operations there. We will see what we can do with uh, this Latin space uh, also in the hands -on. Uh, session. So the, what people are doing is they are using uh, the variational autoencoder uh, part. So they have the encoder, as we explained. The decoder of uh, a variational autoencoder becomes the generator for the GANs. And uh, then uh, uh, the GAN network, instead of uh, uh, taking some random samples and, try and having the discriminator to understand if uh, those uh, samples, uh, if the generated images are fake or uh, real, it takes samples from uh, the variational autoencoder. So the output of variational autoencoder, uh, it's, uh, it's what the discriminator uh, tries to uh, discriminate between fake and image. As a result, this process helps the uh, decoder of variational autoencoder to become smarter and smarter as the discriminator of uh, GANs becomes uh, s smarter. We won't have time to go through this uh, uh, part in uh, this workshop, but I have a notebook for you uh, so that you can uh, uh, play with it uh, if you want. So let's go to the uh, hands-on session. And uh, please go to this uh, address. It's uh, a GitHub account that has uh, some uh, notebooks and uh, for both parts, for both the image and text generation. And uh, yeah, we can uh, see.
Did you go there? How many of you have gone there? Okay, let's wait just a bit. Okay, you will see the others. So you should be looking something uh, like that. Uh, this is how the structure looks like. It's, uh, there is a readme file with uh, uh, references for uh, the text generation uh, uh, part. So, uh, so Nali and Kuhn will explain that later. Now we go to uh, image generation part. And then we can see the uh, two notebooks. Let's go to, uh, yeah. Uh, here on the first part, you can see the slides that uh, I presented with uh, references there if you are interested in the images or uh, combinations of uh, VIEs with uh, guns. And uh, we can go to a notebook uh, from there. The first one. And we see how it looks like. And uh, we press uh, the button, open in collab, so that we will uh, work with it in uh, Google Collaboratory. Let's see the buttons there. Have you gone there? How many of you are uh, on? Uh, have, have they have managed to open uh, the notebook on Collab? Okay, so we can start. Uh, what uh, we are going to work on? It's about uh, uh, basically image generation on a fashion dataset. So it's a dataset that has been uh, uh, released by Zalado Research uh, in order to have uh, more uh, a very easy dataset to work uh, with in terms of pre-processing and training uh, neural networks, very fast uh, uh, to train neural networks there. Uh, and they are not as boring as, uh, as simple digits and so on. And uh, what we need to do is to make sure basically also that uh, our uh, runtime is set to GPU. So if you go to uh, runtime, change runtime uh, type and go this. <laughs> Make sure that it's uh, GPU and saves that will uh, help us having uh, more time. And uh, uh, yeah, we are using also Keras uh, uh, with TensorFlow in the backend and Keras probability. So we can start uh, running uh, uh, our notebook. We can uh, start basically installing our uh, requirements. Oops, it was not uh, really connected. Uh, what do we will need as requirements for that? It's uh, TensorFlow uh, 2 for sure. Uh, Collab uh, currently runs with TensorFlow 1. And uh, this is, uh, but it's going to change soon. And uh, the probabilistic reasoning for uh, TensorFlow. So it's, uh, uh, you should be uh, downloading your data now. Okay, like this? <laughs> it's text for requirements, etc. We can load uh, our uh, modules, which is basically typical uh, uh, yeah, modules if someone wants to have uh, such a notebook. I would, uh, another thing I would like uh, uh, to mention is that there are uh, two APIs, uh, if you are not familiar with Keras, 
to work with. One is the sequ sequential KPI and the other one is the functional uh, KPI. We are going to use uh, the sequential one because it's simple, uh, simple in a sense that it allows you to stack layers uh, one next to the other very quickly. The functional uh, API allows you to uh, give, uh, uh, it's more flexible uh, in a sense that it allows you to give um, input of one layer to other layers that they are not the next one in stack necessarily, but we are not, we are not going to do that uh, with, uh, we will have a simple uh, variational encoder uh, here. And uh, we have uh, yeah, some notebook aesthetics. Uh, you can find also some description of uh, the fashion data set. It has uh, 60,000 uh, training examples and 10,000 test examples. And uh, yeah, let's load the, email, the uh, files. And uh, let's visualize some images using Matplotlib. So we can see uh, how they uh, look like. We see some sneakers, uh, some uh, t-shirts, uh, some dresses, yeah, uh, some ankle boots, some sandals there. And uh, what we try, we will uh, try to do, basically it's to learn uh, the distribution of those images and generate new ones. And we start with um, our uh, coding here. So what we need to define, uh, it's like uh, normal uh, neural network uh, things like uh, badge size. We uh, still need to have badges to train the networks, uh, dimension, uh, the dimensions of uh, the data set, etc. So, and then we can start uh, doing some uh, pre-processing, which is not uh, something uh, uh, difficult in this data set. Uh, we just uh, basically reshape it in a format that we can pass it to TensorFlow. What we are using here, it's uh, the data set, uh, uh, yeah, uh, the data set uh, class of TensorFlow in order to create uh, uh, TensorFlow data sets. It's uh, quite efficient and uh, it creates a batch of a particular batch size and shuffles the images in a quite efficient way. There are also, also TensorFlow has also different functions, but this one is uh, very efficient. So we can run this. And we go yeah, with so uh, simple uh, pre-processing, we can go to the interesting part of uh, our, uh, uh, yeah, our hands-on session, which is we start uh, defining variational autoencoder uh, model which is uh, going to be an extension of, uh, of, uh, yeah, of Keras model, the class of Keras uh, model. In order to initialize that class, we will have the encoder and the decoder there. Someone can have different implementations, but what uh, I think it's uh, nice uh, to see, it's uh, how uh, the, uh, someone can uh, implement the encode and uh, uh, the sampling part. Uh, so for uh, the encode part, uh, you can uh, see it uh, here. Uh, it takes the uh, encoded, um, yeah, encoded uh, input image and uh, uh, it uh, returns back a distribution of it, the mean and the standard deviation of uh, a particular distribution. And uh, uh, then uh, the function uh, reparameterize. Uh, uh, what it does, it samples from that distribution, uh, taking as input uh, the, that mean and uh, variance. Actually, for in order to train of this particular variational autoencoder uh, more stably, uh, we use log variance instead of uh, standard deviation or variance, but it's uh, exactly the same idea as I present before. Now uh, we have just to uh, use the exponential of the log variance in order to sample uh, the distribution. And then we can uh, have a function uh, to uh, reconstruct uh, the image, which yeah, 
uh, takes the input of the encoder and calls yeah, the decoding function. So that's a way how we can uh, call different functions of our variational autoencoder. And uh, yeah, and of course, computing our loss function. What uh, we said is that the loss function uh, it's, uh, um, has two components. Uh, the uh, the uh, reconstruction loss, which tries to, uh, yeah, what I'm using here is mean square error, it tries to reconstruct uh, the input uh, image in a very uh, good way. And it has also the latent loss, the KL uh, uh, loss, which uh, what it tries uh, to do, it's to penalize distributions on the encoder that they are very different from the standard normal distribution. So we call the encoding part, we sample from that, we decode, and then we compute the loss function. And uh, of course, someone uh, needs to run uh, oops, back uh, propagation uh, as the normal uh, neural networks. And yeah, we need uh, some ways to compute uh, gradients, etc. It's like normal back uh, propagation. And the way that uh, uh, the reason that it's uh, uh, a normal uh, back propagation, even though we have this uh, uh, probabilistic uh, uh, aspects of it, it's something that is called a reparameterization trick. I uh, explain this on the notebook, but uh, yeah, I don't think we have a lot of time to go through it. I also have a source. It's uh, the, the way that we sample uh, from uh, uh, the encoder, the, what we said the encoder is for its point returns a mean, uh, a distribution basically. So um, the way that uh, this works, it's that uh, instead of considering that we have a layer that it's uh, uh, like uh, a probabilistic layer with uh, distributions of the different inputs that we have, uh, we uh, consider that uh, we sample from those distributions and we have a kind of a fixed uh, um, a fixed latent space for for that particular sampling that we did as a result basically our latent space it's uh, a function of uh, the mean and uh, yeah the covariance matrix uh, here uh, the standard deviation uh, variance whatever and someone can compute uh, partial derivatives of them and going uh, and, uh, compu and f doing uh, normal back propagation. If someone is interested in that, uh, uh, yeah, I have a source there. And yeah, I explained the variation loss. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, uh, convolutional neural networks, even though we had a session in the morning, I would like uh, yeah to have I have some uh, live images here uh, from that. Uh, they can remind you what uh, is this. Uh, you are familiar with convolutional neural networks, right? I expect so. And uh, what uh, we need in autoencoders that it's different in order to, uh, uh, in the decoder part, to increase uh, the image, uh, so the, uh, in the Latin space representation into the original uh, input dimensions so that we have the reconstructed image. It's uh, transpose convolution layers as well, which is called so the convolutions. And uh, uh, yeah, here uh, we define the actual architecture of our neural network. So what do we do for uh, the encoder? It's uh, yeah, we have the input layers, just two convolutional neural networks. Uh, then we flatten. Uh, the input, and uh, yeah, we have another dense um, layer. And for the decoder, we do exactly the opposite uh, uh, um, process. We uh, take a dense, uh, we, we get basically the result from the encoder through a dense layer, and then uh, just uh, to a convolutional uh, Deconvolutional layers in that case.
And yeah, we can create the model the same way. Oops, I didn't run it. The similar, a similar way. Okay, it runs. Should be able to run it. This is run. And yeah. And we create the model. We can see, for example, uh, the summary of the model, what I described, and the number of parameters that it has. And we go to training the model in order to plot uh, uh, the reconstructions. There is some uh, kind of uh, yeah, trivial plotting function here. And uh, we can proceed and actually train our neural network. And uh, I train it here for 50 uh, epochs so that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, see the results. We can see if you train it, how the, your original data looks like, uh, how uh, your reconstructed images look like. I think, yeah, here you go. Yeah. I have to make it smaller so that we see it better. And you can see that for its epoch, how our results, they are being improved uh, for that. And on the last row, what we see is uh, some uh, generating samples. What we are doing is we're just sampling the Latin space. We take random samples there. And so we see what kind of images we can uh, get from it. So we see, uh, indeed, uh, even though it's uh, for uh, eight epochs, uh, we see that, indeed, various knowledge decoders produce blurry images. It's something uh, we can see. It, it's, yeah, sure. So, but the samples, it's a uh, purely random sample, or is it sample Pure. for the specific execution? It's uh, for the generating images for that notebook, it's completely random. But but you can do it around a specific uh, distribution, and you can, uh, yeah, yeah, guide your sampling process to what you prefer. It's for this one. It's just random. Yes, you. Yes. Exactly. Uh, it's being returned back, and uh, uh, then you take uh, the average of them. But what someone can do, and I would like also to say for that, if we have the time uh, for during that session, it's that you can separate them or add weights to them, and having uh, uh, so do use uh, uh, that weight as a hyperparameter and uh, optimize it. So it depends on how someone wants to reconstruct uh, good images and uh, uh, basically have good generalization properties, if we see it like this. And uh, this is a hyperparameter, hyper we can see it. For the moment, yeah, we, for this uh, demo as it is now, we can uh, consider that um, uh, it's 50-50. Uh, yeah, it's 0 0.5. Yes, uh, you, you can uh, uh, you can uh, see that where I compute uh, the reconstruction losses. It's uh, the sum. And uh, for example, another uh, uh, thing uh, that, yeah, that uh, I have here, someone basically can use just uh, uh, the reconstruction lo loss completely 
and see that uh, it uh, returns uh, results and uh, representations exactly as uh, normal autoencoders. Yeah, it takes some time. I think it's because of network. And then what uh, we are going to do, it's uh, basically to visualize our Latin space to see how it looks like for those uh, images and uh, uh, try to do uh, something like uh, uh, what uh, uh, Ruben also was suggesting, that we try to go to uh, direct our uh, data generation process to through particular directions, basically something that looks la more like uh, uh, pullover or something that looks more like ankle boot, etc. Seven more uh, epochs to go, and I will go through uh, uh, the rest of it uh, fast. Interesting because we have uh, random samples here. What we can see, it's some images, they look uh, uh, from the uh, randomly uh, sampled space, they look something in between, uh, for example, uh, uh, trousers and dresses. You can see that uh, it goes uh, uh, a bit uh, weird. So let's uh, uh, try to see basically how the Latin space of the training images looks like. And we see yeah, what uh, exactly we were expecting. And uh, if we want uh, to see, for example, uh, some interesting patterns here, we see, for example, that uh, ankle boots, uh, sneakers, and uh, sandals, they are uh, all together in a similar area. While, for example, uh, t-shirts and shirts, they are uh, on a similar area as well. We can try to visualize it with uh, uh, other uh, dimensionality reduction techniques like uh, UMAP, for example, which is really state of the art on uh, doing uh, visualizations into a dimensional space. But of course, it cannot be used for data generation. Just for us to see uh, how uh, our uh, uh, autoencoder uh, worked for uh, two dimensional representation. And we will see basically that the clustering is uh, quite similar, but uh, more well separated, something that was expecting for a uh, very uh, low dimensional technique. And uh, basically how to generate and to take some time. Okay. Uh, I will explain uh, the rest of uh, uh, the notebook so that uh, till uh, uh, UMAP it's running so that uh, we can uh, finish and uh, uh, hang it over to Sonali and Kuhn. So um, what, uh, another thing that uh, uh, we can uh, uh, do, it's, uh, uh, yeah, we can generate images uh, like uh, random, random link sampling or generating images by creating a grid and uh, seeing how this uh, works. Or we can uh, direct the process. Okay, we got 
uh, how yeah the image looks like. It's yeah uh, we can see that it's a kind of a similar uh, representation. So t-shirts and shirts they are uh, still here again together, which means that uh, uh, yeah the images they cannot be separated very well. So that's also why uh, we see it in the Latin space of variational logic order overlapping. So we can get uh, by comparing those two visualizations. Uh, an evaluation of our Latin space from the encoder, because uh, yeah, this uh, uh, UMAP uh, visualization it's really optimized in order to uh, to uh, this to do this uh, two-dimensional um, representation. And uh, going again to generating some images from a grid, we can see how our images they change. Uh, basically from the grid, from uh, pullover to trousers, for example. Or uh, here, I think it's from bag to pullover and so on. Or what we can do, it's uh, we can, uh, oops, yeah, because it needs to be, anyway, this is text. And what, uh, another thing we can do, it's on our Latin space. We can basically uh, find which is the average position of a dress or the average position of a pullover. Or uh, we can create also a vector that uh, goes from uh, towards the direction of pullover and uh, generate uh, images, thereby adding different uh, uh, weight on uh, the uh, positions on uh, that uh, uh, Latin space, and we see something that starts like uh, a dress, more or less, and uh, goes towards the direction of pullover with different uh, weights on that. I'm already over time, so I would like uh, to hand it to uh, Kun and Sonali. You can uh, play with the notebook. Do you have any other questions? So let's go towards uh, text generation. Hello, hello. Is it on? All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm Kun, and together with Sonali, uh, we're doing an internship here focused on generative artificial intelligence. And we're going to tell you something about uh, a basic way to generate sequences of text. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a question. How many of you know about the current neural networks? I assume a lot of you know about it. All right, cool. Um, so, we're going to use your current neural networks to generate text, and um, I don't know if you guys know the name of this conference, it's the annual meeting of uh, the Association for Computational Linguistics, and it's a conference that focuses on natural language processing, and as you can see, it's gaining a lot of popularity the last few years, um, 
And uh, with this popularity also comes text generation, which is a really interesting topic. Uh, because there's a lot of applications for text generation. You could do text summarization. Uh, you can write an annual report based on all your uh, financial, um, uh, financial values. Um, you can create a Twitter bot. There's actually a really funny example of this, uh, which is not working anymore. Uh, it's not producing tweets anymore, but it's called Deep Drump. And they basically trained uh, a model on Trump's tweets. And you can look it up. It's funny. It's really funny. Um, and another thing that, that they're doing in Greenhouse a lot as well is conversational marketing. Um, and you can use generative AI in this field as well. So when we're working with text, text is a kind of sequential data. Um, so you have words following up each other. And um, it's a sequence of data points. And some data is um, <clears throat> you need to keep in mind that if you're writing a text, the next word is based on the words that come before. So you need to have that information in your, uh, in your system. Um, and to make text computer readable, we need to convert it into numbers because uh, when you create a, uh, a model, it takes numbers as an input. Uh, if you put in text, not much is gonna happen. Um, so that's also something we do in the notebook, which you'll see in a few minutes. Um, so let's start off with recurrent neural networks for those of you that don't know it. Um, so I think all of you are familiar with neural networks, right? All right. So you have an input here. This is the red dot. And it goes into the, um, into the recurrent neural network block. And what happens is it gives an output. It predicts what is the next um, part of the sequence. And what it additionally does is that the output is also serving as an input to the next time step. Um, so you get an output here, which is the output of the model. And then in the next time step, you put the same um, output in the model again, so it can uh, keep this information in account when generating the next part of the sequence. And so it's one block, but if you unroll the block, it looks like this. So over here, you have time step one, time step two, time step three, and so on. Um, so it's the same block, but it just gets uh, recurrently activated with the new information uh, in mind. Um, and after you have the output, it goes in a softmax function, which basically assigns a probability to um, all the words in the vocabulary. And um, then you get uh, this uh, probability um, is weighed against the ground truth. So you have an input word, and um, <clears throat> in the data, there is a next word in the sequence. But your uh, network also predicts an next word in the sequence. Um, well, it predicts a vector of probabilities. And then uh, this probability vector is uh, compared to the ground truth. And based on this, um, there is a backpropagation. Uh, and there's a, it's a specific kind of backpropagation, backpropagation through time. It works a little bit different than normal backpropagation, but we won't go into that. Um, so you can look that up if you are interested in that. And, um, well, the exciting part of this uh, workshop is, of course, generating the text with an RNN. And uh, the way we do that is we um, train our model, and the model learns to predict what is the next word in the sequence. And what we do then is the, uh, the word that it has predicted, uh, the vector of all the probabilities, um, we sample a word from that. And there are multiple ways you can do that. Uh, you can just pick the word with the highest probability. Um, what you get is a very predictable algorithm that just picks the most probable word. Uh, so you're going to have the same output for uh, some certain input. Um, but that's quite boring. Uh, so what we do is uh, random sampling. So you have this vector of all the probabilities. And then um, you just uh, randomly sample one of the words. And the words that have a higher probability of being the next word in the sequence also have a higher probability of being sampled. And um, you can control this by adding temperature, which is a hyperparameter that determines um, how high, uh, if you have a high probability, the probability of that word also gets raised. So it's higher 
uh, higher chance of picking that word. And if you have a low, uh, a very high temperature, uh, if you have a very low temperature, that happens. If you very, have a very high temperature, then the uh, model basically uh, upgrades the probability of uh, high probabilities already. So what happens then is that um, the model becomes more predictable, and we don't want that, so we set the temperature a little bit lower, so it becomes less predictable, and you get more interesting outputs. Um, so that's what happens here at the top step. And then that output the model creates, uh, generates, is also an, ad, an input to the next time step. And then the same process happens again. Uh, you get a new word, and then in the end, um, for example, a user input could be food, and then the model generates is, and then is is a new input, very, and so on. And then it generates a sentence over here, uh, or maybe multiple sentences based on how long you want your sequence to be. Um, and then you have a generated uh, piece of text. So that's how the, there's a question, yes? That's basically what it does. So um, the temperature um, determines that if you uh, you have this factor of probabilities, and the temperature basically uh, gives a higher value to high probabilities, so it even increases them more, and it gives a lower value to probabilities that are already low if you have a high temperature. So if you have a lower temperature, the words become more random because you get more cramped, and then uh, a word that would be very random gets a higher probability so there's a higher chance of picking that word um, instead of having no high temperature. So that's basically how it works, um, which is very useful. You can play around with it and see uh, what happens if you have a high temperature, if you have a low temperature. Um, yeah. We'll finish with the theory part first and then go into the workshop. Um, so there's a problem with RNNs, and that is um, that there's long-term dependencies in text. And since an RNN has no way of uh, remembering something that was way in the past, uh, we need to figure out how to do that. There's a really nice visualization here of how that works. Um, so the part that is remembered is on the left. And this is basically uh, going through time. And as you can see, the more you go into time, the more the information of the input layer is wasted of the first time step. So it gets uh, less and less um, relevant. Um, and that's something we can solve with um, LSTMs, uh, long short-term memories. I don't know, does, uh, how many of you know what LSTMs are and how they work? Okay, that's a few of you. Um, I don't know how much time we have. Go? Okay. So first at a basic RNN block, um, and I'm gonna go through it uh, quite fast. Um, you can go back to the slides if you want to get a better explanation because you have a really extensive uh, piece of text accommodating with every picture. Um, but what happens is um, this part is the basic RNN block. And the LSTM part is basically this whole piece. Um, so what happens is um, you have the forget gate. And what the LSTM does, it remembers a word or some words that were in the past. Um, so using the forget gate, it tells itself which words to forget um, for the next input word. So if you are remembering a verb, for example, and a new verb comes up, it's, it's useful to forget the old verb because you have a new verb to work with. Uh, that's what this gate does. There's a second gate. Uh, it's called the update gate. And that basically says, oh, wait, this new value is very interesting. We need to remember it. And uh, it gets pushed towards the um, cell memory, which is the top part. So we first forget the information we need to forget and then it updates and adds the information we need to keep, so the new verb. So then it gets updated. And then we get to the output gate. And what happens here is that um, the uh, input 
gets evaluated um, together with the old uh, output of the prior LSEM block. And the memory state over here gets um, added as, a, uh, as another way um, to look at the earlier dependencies. So now you have the uh, information that you needed to remember. It gets collected and it gets used in um, the prediction of the next output. And over here, the cell state goes to the next LSTM block, and the new output goes to the next LSTM block as well as a new input. And over there on the top, you see the output. Uh, so that would be our uh, prediction. This is some further reading. You can um, check the slides later. They are also in the GitHub. Um, this is um, attention transformer models. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but that's basically the um, it's becoming the state of the art now. Uh, GPT-2, if that tells you something, that's also based on attention, and um, it's very interesting. Uh, but we'll not go into that now because that's uh, a little bit too much for one workshop. Um, and then we can go to the workshop. Thank you. And that's something that Sonali will. Uh, okay. Hi guys. Does it work? Yeah. Perfect. So uh, I'll ask you to go back to uh, Dimitra's uh, uh, GitHub. And if you go to the text generation part, yeah, you can open the notebook that says Shakespeare Pi Data because we're going to work with Shakespeare text. We have another notebook that is based on Sherlock uh, Holmes' uh, uh, data set, which has a lot of stories, but this is more like a homework for you, so when you go home, you can check that out. So open it in Colab. And if you have any questions during the whole uh, workshop, let me know, and I'm going to go through it quick because we don't have a lot of time. Oh, yeah. Uh, is the size fine, or should I increase it? Yeah, okay. So the first thing you want to do is uh, mount your Google Drive. Uh, second, yeah, it'll be to mount your Google Drive just in case if you want to um, save some checkpoints or save some files. So that what it does is basically link your collab to your Google Drive. And you can all do that as well. And make sure that all of yours um, runtime is on GPU, like we did before with uh, Dimitra's uh, uh, notebook. Yeah. Okay. So these are some uh, libraries that we are going to import. Most of them are Keras and um, TensorFlow backend, uh, NumPy, and uh, Glob is basically. Uh, library to import a lot of your files. We're not going to use it in this notebook. It's going to be in the next notebook, but uh, you can look at it later. And uh, the next step is to clone the GitHub repository here so that we can access the data set and the checkpoints that you saved before. <coughs> yeah. So we open the Shakespeare data, the text file, and we see what some of it looks like. So the goal for this uh, workshop will be to generate text that is in the, in the style of Shakespeare. If you all know, there are certain uh, vocabulary that Shakespeare use, uses in his uh, text. So that's our goal. And uh, the next step is the processing step. So what we do here first is uh, take the data. And these, uh, these things you see, the replace, um, commands, what we want to do here is uh, uh, insert white spaces around punctuation. So generally when you do text generation, the common, um, the common thing to do is uh, just to remove punctuation. But what we want our model to do is also learn when to generate punctuations with your data. So what we do is just add space there so that when you split it based on the white spaces, it also uh, takes the punctuations as tokens. So it's a very simple step. And uh, what story in words this uh, uh, list does is, is it takes all your stories and it creates a 
token. So in this uh, variable, you have your entire stories, but in tokens. So here you know the total number of tokens in the story is uh, this number. And the unique words are 14,833. So in this tokens are included all your words and also punctuations. Now the next step is to um, split these tokens into sequences. Here you see sequence length, and this is a hyperparameter that you can change and play along with. Basically, this is the number of words that your model will look at when it's predicting the next word. So for here we do 10. Uh, you can do it 50, 100. It depends uh, what you want it to be. So when our model is going to be predict predicting the next word, it's going to look at the last, last 10 words. So this is what sequence length uh, signifies. So what we do here is go over our entire stories and take sequences of 10 plus 1, sequence length plus 1, which is 11, and make sequences of it. So this is what we're doing here. This is for the benefit of tokenization and for training, for creating our data set. Next we, uh-oh, what happened here? Yeah, so we use a Keras library called Tokenizer. What it basically does is, so what, as Kuhn said before, your machine, your model needs numbers, not text. So what we do here is uh, give it all your sequence data, which is text, and it maps every unique word or token to an integer. And uh, tokenizer.txt uh, to sequences, what it does is it converts all your lists of words into tokens so that you can give it to your model. And to see this, you can see this example. If you give it a sentence called, you are, you are all res resolved rather to die than to famish. This is one of the line taken from Shakespeare. And you can see the representation of it as, to uh, as integers. So each... Uh, unique word has a unique integer that represents it. And the vocabulary length here is your number of words that are in the vocabulary. Sorry. Total is the number of uh, data points you have and for your training and testing purposes you want to split it. We do a general split which is 15% test data and 85% training data. This is what is happening here, it's very trivial. And then we build our RNN model. Uh, actually, when we were doing this, we wanted to build a very simple model given uh, the time constraints, and it's quite interesting to see how such a simple model can still generate text. So uh, we have some uh, uh, stacked layers here, and you can look into the links and see the arguments that it takes. You can play around with the, the hyperparameters that are the unit lengths. And here, what we do is just take an embedding layer, which is a form of uh, dimension redu reduction, and then we just stack some simple RNNs with dropout. Uh, do you know? Do you guys not know what dropout is? Yeah. For those who don't know, it's basically uh, what it does. It offsets some of your neurons in your network uh, randomly, so that uh, to create regularization in your model, and that prevents overfitting in the model. So you compile the model with the loss as cost, uh, categorical cross-entropy. And we do this because we feed the target, the output uh, uh, data set, as one hot encoding vectors. That is, there's a zero when the class is not there and one for the class it's representing. And this is the summary of the model. Now are some helper functions. This is just a generator function that generates yields your X and Y input and output uh, data uh, parallelly with the model. And this is to just create efficiency. This is temperature sampling that Kuhn was telling you about before. Temperature is another hyperparameter that you can set. We set it later uh, when we call it. And it's basically sampling uh, randomly your next uh, word. And you, you give it uh, the logits from the softmax as an input. And you random, randomly sample, but on a multinomial uh, distribution. And this is a very trivial uh, function just when you display your story.
These are some checkpoints we create for our model, which is basically early stopping. Early stopping is when uh, you want your training to stop if your, tra if your model is not doing any better. And you monitor the val uh, validation accuracy here. And model checkpoint is uh, saving your weights so that you don't have to train from scratch every time. That's what we're going to do here. We're not going to train from scratch. Uh, you can uh, do that if you want. But uh, I'm going to uh, un uncomment this. So we can just uh, save, uh, uh, load us a safe checkpoint from before. Yeah, and uh, you can train it as well, but for now we won't do it because of the time. And now comes the generation part. So there are two kinds of generation that we're going to do. One is conditional, where you, uh, as, a, as a user, input a text, uh, and it's going to generate uh, the Shakespeare style text based on your uh, prompt. And one is unconditional uh, sampling. And uh, what it does it, is that it creates a random seed. And from that random seed, it's going to uh, generate some uh, samples. So you can play around with this. So I'm going to, do you, does that, uh, anybody have a prompt for me that I should give it to the model? Anybody? Okay, then I'm going to write something random. Just something very random. So the parameter is here, number of words is 500, and this is the number of words that you want it to generate. And temperature is the temperature that I told you about before for the sampling part. So this is the text that it generated. And it's quite random. And you can see that it's in Shakespeare style. Uh, and the grammar sometimes makes sense, but it's quite random. If you start from the top and if you go in the bottom, the bottom doesn't relate too much on the top. And this problem will be similar in LSTMs. But uh, hopefully it should be much better with LSTMs because it uh, remembers longer dependencies. And when you go down, there is uh, your LSTM model. And you can run it as well. And you can even play around with unconditional sampling and see what it generates uh, very randomly. <coughs> oh, no. I'm going to do an uncondition oh, no, unconditional sampling. Hmm. One second, maybe I didn't. So this is uh, a sample that it generated unconditionally. This is the first letter that it took uh, randomly. And this is what came out of it. So the limitations here are that it doesn't remember a lot what is happening in the past. It just sees the last 10 uh, words. But I think that's, an, that's not enough. If you're writing a story, you want to remember all the story before. But that's computationally very expensive. So if you go to the GitHub repository, which is, there's a lot of uh, further reading. And uh, we encourage you to look into active, uh, attention uh, mechanism and GPT-2 models that use a lot of attention mechanism that curb this, uh, this problem here. And it's quite interesting. And I don't know if you know about GPT-2 by OpenAI. Uh, so basically, it. Uh, it created four sized uh, text generation models. And earlier before, they were not releasing their biggest size because of fear of fake news. And recently, a few weeks back, they released their full size uh, uh, GPT-2 model. And the results are very exceptional. You can go to talktotransformer.com and play around with it. So this, what we uh, show, uh, showed you was a very basic uh, example of what can be done. And if you add attention mechanism to it and make 
your model bigger and more complex, uh, it could work even better. And you can play around with this. And there's another uh, notebook that's Shakespeare that takes the Shakespeare data, which is also in the repository. And you can, in your free time, play around with it and change the hyperparameters, change even the model structure, and train and see what happens. Yeah. Uh, I don't think there's a rule of thumb, and it's uh, like you said something that should be a hyper, should be part of hyperparameter tuning, uh, which is a process when you uh, look into the optimal uh, hyperparameter for which your model works best. So this is what it should be. So here it kind of works because of the way the text are written; it's dialogues. So here it kind of works when you do ten, but if you're doing uh, Sherlock stories, which are whole paragraphs with dialogues and scenery that's set into it, it doesn't work quite well. And I think there you need attention as well to remember what happened before. And yeah, uh, does anybody have any other questions? No? OK. Well, I'll be around if you, if you need something. And yeah, thank you.